Good morning. Let's sing some songs together.
and every day be continually molded and shaped in the, into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We give you all the thanks. We give you all the praise for you alone are the one who is worthy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. Glad you could join us this morning. I trust that you are comfortable. I'm comfortable here. I'm sitting down this morning and, and uh, just going to be teaching you from the comfort of my chair. And I trust that you are comfortable where you're at. You trust you've got your Bible, maybe a cup of coffee. I invite you to, uh, to open up in your Bibles. We're going to be starting a new series today in Romans. And instead of uh, taking time to study the entire book of Romans, we're going to be um, focusing on just two chapters over the next six weeks. We're going to kind of take a deep dive into Romans chapters uh, 12 and 13. And, uh, you know, all of, all of Romans 12 and 13 uh, comes after Paul has laid down this comprehensive treaty uh, to us to help us, to help everybody understand their guilt before God, what sent Jesus to the cross. Now, last week we had the opportunity to celebrate Easter, right? And, and when we celebrate Easter, we're not just uh, studying the fact that Jesus died. We are, we are appreciative of that fact, but it's, it's beyond just the fact of that death to the why. Why did Jesus go to the cross? And Romans is that treatise. It's, it's that um, just really comprehensive foundational understanding that Paul lays down so thoroughly that we are all guilty before God. And, and that guilt of our sin um, ultimately is what sent Jesus to the cross, was to pay for that that sin debt that we had. In, uh, in Romans chapter 1, uh, we read, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. And so what we find in the first seven chapters really of Romans is this just comprehensive, uh, you know, line by line. It is not just Gentiles who are guilty before God. It is also Jews who are guilty before God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6, 23 says that the wages of that sin, what we deserve because of our sin, is death. And then chapters really like 7 through, well, actually starting in chapters 8 through about 11, uh, we find Paul talking about the new life that we have in Christ, that we have become heirs together with Christ, Jews and Gentiles, and that we have a new life because of the Holy Spirit that has been given to us as a gift. And, uh, and then he also, in, in chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul talks about the relationship that God has with the Jewish people and what his plans are, still a mystery, but what his plans are uh, for the Jewish people. And if you really want to get a, a better understanding of, of, of how the book of Romans is all put together, I would really encourage you to watch 
a couple of videos done by The Bible Project. They do a fantastic job of just really breaking down the book of Romans. And I would encourage you, I'll probably put links in the, um, in the comments section below this video so that you can dive into that. If you uh, have a Right Now Media account, you can watch all of those videos for free uh, through Right Now Media. But anyway, uh, I just really would encourage you, if you have some extra time, as many of us do have a lot of extra time right now, uh, I would encourage you to watch those videos to, to gain a better understanding, really, of what the, the story of, of um, and what is being revealed through uh, the book of Romans as we, as we embark on this study to understand where Paul is coming from uh, when he comes to Romans chapter 12. And he, he uses the, that transitional, ever important transitional phrase, therefore, <laughs> such an important word um, that, that we find in scripture. And I'll read for us our, our passage this morning is going to be uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It reads, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. My family, uh, we just finished watching through the popular TV series, Lost. And one of the things that made that show so unique was the way the, uh, the, the producers and the directors, the way that they would have these flashback sequences that would fill in the backstory of what the character uh, was going through and, and how that thing in the past uh, helps inform the thing that is taking place in the future and and what a what a cool way to structure that show but it's it's those flashbacks that each time there's a flashback there's more and more detail that is given that helps you understand uh, more of the story and and it's those flashbacks really that are kind of the inspiration behind uh, this series uh, that we're going that we're starting on this morning now uh, Romans 12. Paul says, I appeal to you, right? He's not starting with a command. He is saying, hey, look, based on everything that I have laid out to you, based on everything that you have you've now understood that God has done for you and for me, I beg of you, I appeal to you, therefore, because of the mercies of God, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Now, James Boyce, I think he hit the nail right on the head. He said, this is one of the great paradoxes of Christianity. And one of the great paradoxes of Christianity concerns the Christian life. We must die in order to live. And, and we, it's not a physical death. We're not, we're not dying physically, being taken out of this world. We are dying to ourselves. We are dying to an old way, an old pattern of living so that we can live now in the newness of life that comes because of all that Jesus has done for us. Paul is pleading with his audience to live their present lives, to live the current lives that they are living in view of this remembering of everything that God has done. Paul states in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, he says, For the love of Christ controls or compels us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he, that is Jesus, died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And so as children of God, we are, we are called to flash back to the life 
that Jesus lived, the death that he died, his resurrection, and see that in those things we now have a new life to live. Not for ourselves, but for him, because he is the one who died for us. And, and, and we are to now live out of the reality of this new framework. And Paul says that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And the foundation for this understanding is Paul makes the argument that the, the bodies that we have, because of the death of Jesus, our bodies no longer belong to us. This is what we find in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And it's not Paul alone, it's also Peter. We find in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed, or that you were, depending on your translation, redeemed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And Peter uses this, this word uh, that can be translated either ransomed or redeemed. And this is such an it's such an integral uh, thing for us to understand. It's a very important concept, and it, it means to purchase out of. To be redeemed means that we were purchased out of the marketplace of sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. We have been ransomed. We have been redeemed. We've been purchased out of that life and given a new life in Christ. And, and based on that understanding, Paul says, rather than offering your bodies as instruments to accomplish things that are sinful, now you should use your bodies to glorify God. And this is the argument that is laid down in Romans chapter 6. He asks the question, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Romans 6, 13, do not present your bodies to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your bodies to God as instruments for righteousness. And here again, John, James Montgomery Boyce, man, what crazy cool insights this guy has, but he, he makes the point here regarding this death to sin. He says, to die to sin does not mean that we've become unresponsive to sin or that we have died to sin's guilt here, it refers to the change that has come about as a result of our being saved. We have died to sin, meaning that as a result of our union to Jesus Christ, by the work of the Holy Spirit, we become new creatures in Christ. We become new creations so that what we were, we can never go back to again. So if we can't go back to that, that old way of life, we have to press on to the new way of life. And this is, this is the, the duty of the Christian life is to, to present our bodies as living sacrifices, remembering that we have been made new creations in Christ and we can't go back. How could we ever go back to that old way of living? We need to now turn our eyes to Jesus and present our bodies to him as living sacrifices that would be holy and acceptable to him. And as I thought about this and I, th I thought about, you know, talking to you this morning, it just really begged the question, how can we use the parts of our body to glorify God? How can you use your eyes and your ears to glorify I really wrestled with this. I mean, to think about this in, 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 in really sober terms, right? To, to understand that if, if I'm only 
putting in front of my eyes, if I'm only filling my ears with things that are ungodly, things that are, are, are not going to fill my life with faith and godliness, but if I'm only paying attention to and listening to things that are, that are ungodly, we might call them secular, not all things that are secular are evil, but if we are only focusing on those things which are secular in nature and never focusing on the things that are going to lead to godliness and inspire godliness in our lives, then how are we using our eyes and our ears? If we're only watching TV or watching things online or listening to secular radio nonstop and never filling, you know, putting before our eyes and listening with our ears things that will inspire faith, faith com coming by hearing and hearing the word of God, right? If, if we're only watching and listening to things that are secular and never faith inspiring, then we are not using our eyes and our ears for the glory of God. We're only using it for our own pleasure, right? Um, our tongues, man, the, the scriptures speak a lot about the power of the tongue. You can read James chapter three and hear about, you know, the, how such a, a large fire is set ablaze by such a small spark from the tongue. You know, and we have such a responsibility as believers to, to use our tongues in a way that will glorify God, not having both salt and fresh water coming out of the same spring, that, but that we would have our, our mouths, our speech seasoned with salt so that it would be a blessing to those who hear. There is so much power in the tongue. How are we going to use our tongues to glorify God and then our hands and our feet how do our hands and our feet fall into this 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 pattern of behavior right where do, where do our hands and our feet take us do they take us to places where God is only going to be denied or blasphemed or are our hands and our feet taking us to places where we will be in fellowship with other people who will be in in inspiring us to more godliness and more faithfulness and more praise to God. You know, we need to uh, remember, I mean, Paul talks about how lovely are the feet of those who bring good news, right? And, and all of these things, it's not, it's not to say that you can only watch or, or listen to, you know, Christian uh, movies or Christian music or that you can only speak, you know, holy things all the time no, no we but we need to have a balance right there there needs to be a sense in which we understand that what it, we have to analyze and think about what are we pursuing in our lives am I pursuing those things that are going to glorify God I mean sometimes that we, we are going to be around non-christian people this is I mean Paul makes that quite clear if God didn't want us around non-believers then he would have taken us out of the world but he hasn't taken us out of the world he has left us to be in the world but as John so aptly put it he says we are to be in the world but not of it right and so we need to be thinking about how how to to live up to this to to present our bodies as living sacrifices that are holy and acceptable to God you know this concept of holiness is is largely just unaddressed, uh, I think, in in our in our modern world, we don't we don't think much of what it means to be holy, uh, other than to think, oh, you know, that person is holy, living holier than thou, right? And and having this attitude that you are better than somebody else because of your holy living. You know, we need to be careful of that. We need to walk humbly before God. But we also need to be seeking to live holy lives because he is holy and he has, he has redeemed us out of the slave market of sin so that we can live holy lives that bring him honor and glory. And so for us, we need to be thinking about how are we using our bodies? Are we using our bodies for our own selves to satisfy you know, sinful lusts or are we using our bodies 
to, to offer up to God as living sacrifices. And then the next part of this, uh, of our passage, you know, after saying that we need to live, uh, you know, be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship, he goes on in verse 2 to say, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Don't be conformed to this world. Conformity speaks to the battle of the mind, right? Your world view. There is a way in which the world operates that we as disciples of Jesus Christ are called to live above, to live outside of, to not be taken captive by those things. What are, what, are the, um, what are the things that, that, that the world offers, you know, that, that um, shape behavior? The worldly systems, we could, we could list them as being fame, wealth, sex, power. You know, each of these things are, are, are worldly attitudes that people chase fame. There are so many people right now that would, that would do virtually anything just so that they could be famous. The world offers wealth as a way of, of being satisfied. It was um, J.D. Rockefeller who was, in his day, he was one of the richest, uh, richest men in the world. He was asked at one time, he says, how much money is enough? And he responded, he said, just a little bit more, right? Wealth could never satisfy. You will always be craving just a little bit more. And the same is with power. You know, masses of people in our world are on a power trip, right? And they love to be controlling of other people. And it's, just as with wealth is with power, you, you always just want a little bit more, right? And it, and it just satisfies this, this lust within you to, to cheat or, or, or take advantage of other people. Uh, and, and we need to be wary of that. And then sexual um, gratification. You know, that the, the drive for sex, there have been so many people whose lives have just been ruined because of that pursuit of sexual gratification. You know, so these things, these, these worldly systems, they, they do not satisfy. They, they, they pretend to, they, they, they kind of advertise themselves as being this way of, of finally being satisfied. But the scriptures are, are what speak truth to you and to me and reveal that those things can never satisfy. It is only God himself who satisfies. And so understanding that we've been purchased out of these worldly systems, how could we continue to pursue them? The, uh, the, the verb here that, that uh, Paul uses, he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. This, this word, word transformed, uh, the Greek word that is, that is used is metamorpho. It's where we get our word metamorphosis, right? And it is, it's, it's an inward transformation that takes place into a completely new thing. This is where... Uh, the, the truth that Paul reveals in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The Christian life is not simply about behavior modification. You know, just finding that list of do's and don'ts. Look, there will be behaviors that change as Christ changes us from the inside out. But our motivation is not just about changing our behavior. It's about glorifying God. And so as we, as we turn to him, as we just thank him for this new life that we have, 
you know, he changes even what we desire into new things. But it's not just exchanging one list for another list. It's not about attaining that list. It's about pleasing and glorifying the God who has paid the ultimate price so that you and I can have new life. And Paul says here, you know, that we need to stop living like the world, stop being having our, our minds shaped by world systems, and instead have our minds, have our world views transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may, that by testing it, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We are transformed as we read the word of God, as we, as we, as we spend time with God and, and pursue him, that he changes us from the inside out to become worthy sacrifices for him. And we have nothing in and of ourselves. It is because all because of what Jesus has done, all that he has given to us by his work on the cross, by dying for you, by being buried and by raising again from the dead, he brings us new life. And so in closing, here are just a few ways that we can renew our minds on God's truth. First, I would encourage you to spend time with God. Just spend time with him. You could do this by reading God's word. You could study God's word. You could memorize God's word. You could, you could find verses that, are, that really speak to the season of life that you are in and internalize it and just ha have it at the ready so that as you're going about your day, you could be meditating on the truth of God's word. So spend time alone with God. Next, I, an idea would be to just set a timer for yourself to take a break from all of the social media, taking a break from your phone, taking a break from any form of screen, right? TV screen, whatever it might be, that you would just turn all of those things off so that you can have time to just let the issues of life percolate and allow God's spirit to speak to you, to reveal wisdom about how to really properly discern what is happening. But we need to, we need to set a timer. We need to, to make sure that we're not only pursuing, you know, streaming that next episode and that, you know, finding that next series or, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, streaming right now is, is up like 150% over what it normally is during a vacation time, right? We need to, we need to set a time aside where we are just, we're not plugged in to anything other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we are, we are tuning our hearts and our minds into him. And then we also need to intentionally, what the scriptures say, pull everything captive to the obedience of God, right? That we, that we don't just let our minds run wild and, and just only ever pursue the things that we want to pursue, but we need to pull our thoughts captive to Christ and, and that we would present them for obedience to him. And we need to be careful to do that. You know, as followers of Jesus, we are no longer um, able to just say, well, I can do whatever I want to whenever I want to because our very lives don't belong to us. They belong to God. Jesus paid for your life. Now give your life freely to him. He wants us not to live in conformity to the world, but to live in conformity to his Holy Spirit that gives newness of life each and every day, renewing our minds on the word of God and on the truths of who he is. You know, living for Christ in this world, it, it is going to be hard. I'm going to be honest with you. It is not going to be an easy pursuit. It's going to be lived in the midst of a God-denying 
culture. That is just the reality of what we will be confronted with in this world. But just think about that day as you daily just seek God, as you seek to have your life laid down before him as a worthy sacrifice that your your mind would be renewed by the word of God that one day when you stand before the father that you would hear the great commendation well done good and faithful servant hearing those words in the end will make it all worth it we won't always know the benefit that is being accomplished either to ourselves or to those around us. But if we're only doing it for those benefits and not doing it for the benefit of the one who paid the price for us, then our motive already is wrong, right? And so, man, I am challenged as I, as I even preach these two verses to you just to think about how do we lay down our lives? How do we offer up our bodies as living sacrifices? How do we allow our minds to be renewed day in and day out for the honor and glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? It will be worth it in the end. Do not give up in doing well. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've had to spend in your word. And we just pray that you would guide us and direct us, that you would, that your Holy Spirit would, would, fill our lives and that we would be obedient to laying down our bodies as living sacrifices to your honor and to your glory and that our minds would, would, would be renewed as we spend time in your word, as we spend time memorizing and, and just thinking about all of the things that you have done for us. God, we are so thankful for the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. God, if there are any who have heard this message and they don't have that new life, I pray that you would just, um, just really help them understand their need for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for his sacrifice for them. God, I pray that they would reach out and that they would get in touch with, with us or a, another church that is close to them that could help them grow in their relationship and, and to know how to have a relationship and then grow in that relationship with you. God, we pray for your blessing uh, upon the rest of our day that you would be honored and glorified because you are the one who is worthy. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless.